And did you know that today there are more self-storage facilities than there are Starbucks, McDonald's, or Burger King's combined? I was just absolutely shocked when I learned that. And my friend Ryan Gibson is amazing. He's an amazing guy. He was a pilot for years. He has transitioned from being a full-time pilot to having raised over $250 million for self-storage. And he's super passionate about it. And it, I mean, self-storage is an absolutely exceptional investment, does great in times of recession. It does great in so many areas for so many reasons. There's a lot of false beliefs that people think about self-storage, which is true of most investments. But I've got him here today. Ryan, it's such a pleasure to have you. Uh, thanks for, for joining us today. Yeah, thanks, Bronson. Appreciate the time. <laughs> absolutely. Well, you you gave me that fact earlier. You said there's more, there's 60,000 uh, you know, self-storage facilities. I was actually wondering if it was number of units, but actually facilities in the U.S. And that's more of, of restaurants than there are of you know, Starbucks, McDonald's, Burger King combined. That was absolutely shocking. So talk to us a little bit. I want to just kind of go into that for a sec. Like, why do people use self-storage? A lot of people think, oh, I've got too much stuff. So I use self-storage. Why do people use self-storage? Yeah, let's let's bust every myth out there about self-storage. <laughs> yes. Let's do it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so first of all, people don't use self-storage because they have too much stuff. It's interesting. I have spoken on this topic many times and I always ask the audience, you know, how many people in the audience have a self-storage? And out of a hundred people, the average in the United States is one in every 10 Americans uses a self-storage. And I always see more hands go up than that one in 10 number. So maybe I'm just talking to a lot of hoarders or something like that. But, <laughs> um, and I speak at high net worth conferences where there's high net worth investors. These are not, this is not just, you know, uh, lower income people using self-storage. Everybody uses self-storage for one reason life events. Everybody's going to have a life event. Because the second question I asked the audience is, how many times did you use your self-storage because you had too much stuff and the hands go down? Mm -hmm. And it's interesting how people actually will use a self-storage, not because they have too much stuff, but because something happens in their life. And what happened to me, I thought self-storage was the stupidest thing ever, but I ended up using a unit twice in my life. And it was because of life events. I had a, a small townhouse in Seattle in Green Lake. And when I sold my townhouse, I sold it because I had a daughter and we were upgrading the size of our homes. And I had to move all my stuff into self-storage in order to stage the home and make it look like no one lived there and put all the fancy stuff in there so I could sell it faster. And then when I moved into my new house, I realized, you know, I probably was going to put my roots down there for a long time, had another son and I had to renovate my basement, make it a little bit bigger and, and COVID hit right? Big, huge life event. And I wanted to have an office so I could work out of my house more. And I just didn't have a very good room for it. So we gutted our entire basement, had to take all my stuff out of my house and move it into self-storage. One last story, when I was a pilot during COVID, I like right when COVID hit, like at the end of March, I was going down to um, uh, Orlando for working a flight. And the flight, I, you know, 190 uh, passenger jet, and I'm, I'm getting on the flight and there's one passenger, right? It's just like when the airports cleared out during COVID. And I went up to that wow. one passenger and I said, I got to ask you, ma'am, what, what, you know, you're the only one on the flight today. <laughs> private <laughs> like jets, private, your private jet today. Yeah, right? <laughs> a private jet to Orlando. But I got to ask, where are you going and why? There's no one in the airport. She said, well, it's actually really sad. My, my, my mother just passed away and I have to go down to Florida to put herself in self-storage. Self so age, divorce, death, downsizing, relocation, you know, we have a, a COVID event where now people are saying, I got to free up a room because I want to work out at home. I don't want to go to a gym or I need a, a permanent office space out of my house. And I have too much, you know, I have, I have to clear out, I have to make way for things, but there's things that I still need. I think, I think people think that self-storage is, you know, oh, it's, you know, someone who can't get rid of their stuff. Now we definitely have that problem in the United States. That's not really what drives our customers to our property. The other thing is businesses. Over 30% of our self-storage customers are businesses. You know, people that are, yeah. you know, working out of their homes to th sell things on Amazon, Etsy, contractors, and other things. So I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, mystery around self-storage. I think that people think it's too much stuff. I think the, the, the reason why you see them built on every street corner now is because Americans use it as a tool for life events. And I think it's just more prevalent in the United States than the rest of the world. So. It's interesting about every asset class. If people have like misunderstandings about everything. Like we do stuff in the ATM machine space. We're like, people even use ATMs. Like, I don't know, but like, there's a segment of the population that uses it all the time. And then the same with like what we know about self storage. I mean, there's like these shows now where it's like you you buy the the vacant. You know, they open, they cut the lock on the unit, and you get whatever whatever's in there, right? Or you get to see it, and people bid on it. And now it's becoming even like HGTV with like house flipping, right? It's like become this whole thing. 
And yet it doesn't really match up with reality. It's like, these are things that you know, we have reality TV and we think it, it's reality. Um, yeah, that's, that's really amazing. So um, I want to get into more about self-storage, but I want to get into your story because I think your story is so fascinating. And it's just, you're somebody that I admire because you went, I mean, there's certain people I look at and it's just like, wow, this person has just been like a rocket ship. Like they started out, they were a pilot. And now like you've raised 250 million in equity, your company. And you've got like, I mean, like hundreds of employees, but it's like this crazy, huge operation. So you take us back to like kind of the beginning of that. Like, you know, you, you're just kind of getting started. And what were some moments that kind of really poured rocket fuel on that for you? Yeah, I, I think syndication is a big one. Um, obviously, learning the tool of syndication and learning that you know you can get people to participate and invest alongside of you is uh, was you know kind of eye opening for me. And and in 2013, you know, I was sitting around a dinner party in my my old neighborhood in Washington D.C. and I was thinking, man, we really want to do this project down the street, but I don't have enough money to do it myself because I've got my money out on all these other deals. But I bet you everybody in the room here in the party would probably have fifty to a hundred thousand that they could put up, and we could do this project in our neighborhood. And I thought mm -hmm. it was such a cool thing that that's actually what happened. We bought we huh. bought this building in our neighborhood, and all of the neighbors invested in the syndication. Wow. So, and then it was just it was it was on from there. And it, you know the reason why people wanted to invest is because we had a good strategic plan. We also they knew were familiar with the project and they loved real estate. And they trusted in what we could do with the asset. So you have those three things. I mean, you can really make a lot of damage. And I think, you know, you can buy a lot and you can really grow your business. And, um, you know, I can't remember where I was, but I heard this, uh, this thing about syndication that really changed my mindset about it, which, you know, a lot of people say like, oh, I don't need to raise money. I have all the money I need to do my own deals. And, you know, you got to think about the most successful companies in the world have investors, you know, Amazon, Microsoft, Google, Starbucks. I mean, all these, all these really highly successful companies, the richest people in the world still have a crop of investors that fuel their business, right? So I think any successful business is going to have investors. And I think what's really unique about real estate is you can actually provide a massive benefit to investors through tax depreciation, mm -hmm. but also allowing them to share alongside in the profits um, of what you do. And it helps you focus on building an actual company versus just getting your deal done. And that's the, that's the mentality that we took to this, which is we're like, you know what? Yeah, we've got our own cash and we could probably just do a couple of deals a year and, and keep it that way. But instead of, you know, using our cash to put into new deals, we put it into hiring out and building an operating platform um, and continuing to hire the best and the brightest people that we could find. And that's really what has helped us scale because then you grow those people and those people into leaders and help the company be more successful in that regard. So I think that's kind of the, the, the mindset shift. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, so for you, like as an operator, because again, I know there's people listening to this that are both investors that were like, hey, yeah, well, and I think anybody who's a passive investor should get very familiar with Spartan because they're doing awesome stuff. And they've, you know, obviously you treat people well. I mean, this is a very small funny. It's, it's a big industry, but it's a small industry. Everybody knows everybody. And so it's kind of like, you know, and what I know about you, Ryan, is you're treating people well. So you get referrals and people are, are really coming back and investing more and inviting their friends and family, even like doing like a community project like that from the beginning is a huge way to build community. But what was the, I guess, uh, from an operator standpoint, so if anybody who's listening, who's either an operator, interested in operating, um, you know, I had a moment where I was at the investor summit on, on a cruise and I approached a successful syndicator and I'd raised a hundred thousand at that point. And after that conversation, uh, we formed a partnership and, and 18 months later, we raised 15 million. And that was a rocket ship moment for me. I'm sure for you, you've had multiples of those, but what was kind of like for you, was there a, a, a partnership or a conversation or a connection that like it just something switched and all of a sudden, okay, instead of raising a million, we're raising like 50 million or 20 million, or, you know, was there something that changed very quickly? You know, it's hard, it's hard to say there was one moment. Um, right. Like you said, I think, I think there was lots of little moments, but I think that just learning more about, um, you know, just being very hungry to learn and being very hungry to um, constantly improve and get better and surrounding people, yourself with people that do that. I mean, I'm very fortunate to have two very good business partners who are nothing like me. Um, you know, one guy is a military strategic decision-making, um, you know, very type A um, leader who, who really takes the charge of leadership and, and growing an organization culturally and then another partner who's just a, I think, a financial savant, you know, just somebody mm -hmm. who knows underwriting, knows how to make a deal, 
um, you know, understands structure, knows how to network as well and kind of make context. And then my, um, you know, my passion has been just in making relationships and, and finding an angle in every single thing that we look at. And mm -hmm. so I think uh, those three ingredients really have um, fueled us to, um, you know, and layer on a, a sense of competitiveness uh, in me. I think that really has been a driver in, in, in the, in the, in the situation. So I don't, I don't think it was one particular conversation. I think we all very much were aligned with where we wanted to go. We were on the same page. I'm sure there's nuances here in our personal lives of what we really want to get out of things, but business-wise, you know, very much aligned and then just different skill sets. Mm. Um, I think that was really kind of what, um, what, what has driven us to be kind of where we are today. Um, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Now I, so for you, like, um, yeah, I, I was thinking about that, you know, with, with single family, I mean, a lot of people start in single family. I don't know if you started in single family. I started in single family, had, you know, four or five houses and I, I was kind of just me doing, yeah. So you, so you similar. So it's a lot of times it's kind of you and maybe you've got a property manager or you've got somebody, but it, it's kind of more of a single operation. But when you go into syndication, almost without exception, I mean, it's, it, it becomes a partnership type of venture. And so how did you get connected? And again, it can go really well. And, you know, there's been a lot of great partners I've had and ones that, you know, you know, we don't really have uh, similar values in certain areas. Right. So how did you decide, was it kind of, did you, with both these partners kind of came in at the same time or did you guys all kind of like, how did that kind of come together? Cause that's obviously it's a very good <laughs> partnership. You're not only well, aligned on us values. Yeah. yeah. That, that is really funny. I, none of us had any real estate uh, background really <laughs> with the exception of Ben had probably the most, um, but very light. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I was actually, this is how I picked my business partner. One day I was sitting in my house in Washington, DC in 2009. And I, it was a very tumultuous time to buy a house. And, and I really wanted the house that went up for sale next to me to go to, to sell. And every single time a prospective buyer walked by, I would walk outside and pretend to check my mailbox to strike up a conversation. <laughs> and about the 14th time that day, uh, Scott, my business partner and his wife, who I had no idea who they were at the time, were walking down the street and I struck up a conversation with them. And I joked that I convinced him to buy the house. Then he convinced me to start this business. Uh, so <laughs> wait, 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 let me, wait, let's slow down for a second. So, so you're, you're trying to like find like guerrilla marketing to sell your house. And so you're going out checking the mailbox to some people walking by and you actually strike up a conversation with people. And this was the 14th conversation that you had with someone and it's Scott and he ends up buying your house. And then in that yeah, he, process, it was the house next you. door. It was the house okay. next door. I really wanted like that house to sell as soon as possible. Right. Cause I, oh, you know, I it was 2011 or whatever, whatever year it was. Okay. And um, yeah, so it ends up being Scott and his wife and he comes in and I, you know, show him around. And, and, uh, and then he ends up moving in next, literally next door to me. Wow. And, um, you know, it's so funny We're we both just happen to be from Michigan and, uh, and then we just both, we're just very much focused on starting a business. And, uh, and so we became friends and, you know, our, our wives and everything, everybody's hanging out doing big dinner, dinner parties. And then I had convinced, uh, numerous other people in the aviation field and other people that I knew and friends of mine to move into that neighborhood actually. So in this little like block in DC, we had a bunch of like people that we knew that lived all within the same area. And it was funny. One of those people was our first investor um, that actually put their, their money in on the first, first deal. And one of those people ended up being our first employee. Mm. And uh, I mean, it just, <laughs> so you can see the relationship <laughs> in me. It's like, yeah. I kind of like, you know, bringing together communities, bringing together people. And that's what a syndication really is. And, and, and just kind of managing that dynamic of an investor community, I think is really important. Um, and just, and, and then it's sort of, you know, my side of the business, I've really pushed that down. Like, you know, Hey, I want, I want, you know, now we have an investor relations team and I encourage my um, you know, the, the folks that work in investor relations, you know, to be, to be that relationship with people, you know, go meet people, go get in coffee, show them property tours, you know, have conversations with them, call them out of the blue and just ask them what they're thinking about. And, uh, you know, all mm -hmm. these things that, you know, are just natural evolution of relationships and, and let's get to know everybody we do business with. And Scott and I are very much aligned in that. And so, um, you know, we've taken that personal approach to everybody we do business with. And, um, that's really, you know, I think what Scott really brought to the fight was the focus on mission, vision, values, you know, we have a very strong, very rehearsed, um, you know, mission, vision, value statement that we say every week on our investor call, on our mm. uh, team calls. 
and we try to carry out that mission. And I think that has been a major, I know that sounds like very simple and very textbook, but it's been incredible in how it's contributed to growth and just, it's been kind of our North star, you know, if, if we get into a situation, we don't know what to do. We fall back on the mission, vision, values of the organization. And that sort of gets us quickly aligned, even though we all have our conflicting personal objectives, you know, we, we look at it from a, you know, what's good for the business. And I think too often people just think about doing deals and the next project and things like that. And they, they don't really spend the time on the mission, vision, values, or making sure that they're actually adhering to them. They just sort of write them down and forget what they were. And I run into a lot of business owners and they say, you know, I've hired all these people and they just, they don't understand my vision or they don't understand what I'm trying to do. And I just, they're, they're all, you know, and I'm like, the first question I always ask them is, well, what's your, what's your mission statement? And they're usually like, well, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> and I'm yeah. like, you don't, you don't know what it is. Yeah. How, how are you going to align your, your people to what right. you're trying to do? If you don't even, if you don't even know what it is. Yeah. Right. And so I think, um, I think that has really helped us and Scott had obviously beat that into our heads. Um, you know, and that was, that was the, the big piece that he, that he's brought and continues to, you know, help us out with. So that's awesome, man. Well, you, you dropped some big time nuggets there and I love what you're sharing. Cause I mean, you talk about, you know, values and vision and mission and just keeping that, of course, the more employees you have, the more you scale, the more important it is. I mean, there's so much information that just shows like as a CEO or as somebody who runs a business, which if you're a syndicator, you raise money for deals, you are, you're, it's your business. And if you can't articulate your, your vision or your mission, or maybe it's clear in your mind, but people have no idea what you're trying to do. Like they just, they don't they have no clue. And you assume, we assume that I, I remember just assuming things and then being like, my employees have no idea what I'm even doing. You know, what even, how does it all come together? So having that clear mission statement. And then I love like your, kind of your origin story, going back to that for a minute. Um, it just really seemed like you found people in your life and you basically just really enrolled them in your vision of like, Hey, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to see. And it's a very, it's an awesome way to do it. Cause these are people that, you know, you're friends with people that you, you align because you have a social and a, and a values and a lifestyle connection. And then you're saying, Hey, let's go do this. This would be, and, and it really is a way you can create a lot of fun together. Right? Cause these people like then Scott's a neighbor and you guys are probably getting together, having a beer on the back porch and just your families are friends. And so I think that's awesome that you're able to create that. And so that culture can, can live on versus, you know, Oh, I'm just going to, you know, find this partner here, whatever. And we look totally different. It's like, no, it seems like you guys are really doing this together. Now, when did you guys, you guys are in Seattle now, and I've, I've kind of been by your, for your office and you're in a beautiful location in Seattle, right? You look out on the water and everything, which is so congratulations on that. But <laughs> when did you make that move from, from DC to Seattle? I mean, I moved from Seattle to LA and got, got out of there, got, you know, it's a little more sunny. Oh, you butter. got out of the rain. I'm jealous. <laughs> today, 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 today there's raining in LA. So it's, it's like a perfect interview to do with you while you're in Seattle. I just, I just left LA and um, okay. man, it was, it was cold for LA this, this time of year. Uh, yeah. yeah. You know, my wife was down there and uh, it's funny. We went to a comedy show and the com and the comedian said, you know, thank you for braving the weather and coming to my comedy show tonight. Cause you know, it was like 45 degrees or something. Um, yeah. Anyway, no, uh, when I was in DC, I was an airline pilot and what brought me to Seattle was Alaska airlines as a pilot, uh, 737 pilot for Alaska, um, obviously since have uh, moved on, but that's what brought me to Seattle and, and, you know, put my roots down here and just really loved the, uh, the, the environment. And we ended up doing several ground up development projects in the Pacific Northwest. We built 755 units, just 30 minutes Southeast of Seattle. We built a brand new 217 lot mobile home park, uh, up in the Olympic peninsula in a town called squim. And then we, we just built another one just outside of Portland. So we started doing a lot of ground ups here and the banks tend to like it on your first few, especially that, you know, you, you live here. Okay. Um, Scott actually moved to Denver eventually. And, um, some of the people from our neighborhood actually moved there okay. and Scott bumped into Ben Lapidus, uh, at a breakfast. So, you know, wow. he was, Ben was out and just kind of doing the thing. And there was a, a local real estate meetup and Ben and Scott were there and, Ben was kind of in between kind of looking to make a splash in real estate. And, uh, and Scott one day is like, Hey, you got to meet this guy. I think you'll really like him. And of course, you know, everybody loves Ben, but, um, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, it just made a, a good trifecta of people. And, um, and, and Scott, we, we didn't have an office originally. We were just sort of doing everything remotely and Scott was having, you know, he's a very much in-person person and, and, and I am too. And so is Ben. But Scott's like, hey, I'm sick of having everybody come over and work out of my house all day. Um, can I get an office? And, and I, you know, I was like, yeah, absolutely. So our headquarters is actually in Golden, Colorado. Okay. And so we've actually changed offices three times in the last like two years because we keep growing and having to upgrade. 
Um, so now we're, we're in gold in Colorado. That's our headquarters. So we have our property management team there, all of our construction, finance, acquisitions, uh, most of the C-suite. And then, um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of our, our base yeah. of operation. Just in Seattle, uh, our office here is uh, mostly investor relations, and then we do capital markets. So we actually have our own debt team in-house that, um, you know, we have to finance these facilities and it takes a lot of, a lot of work to do that. Um, you know, closing them, financing, identifying lenders, et cetera. So we do all of that work out of the Seattle office. And likewise, a lot of our investors live in the Pacific Northwest. So, okay. That's awesome. I love it. Well, I, I have a special place in my heart for the Pacific Northwest and, uh, <laughs> go Seahawks. They're doing better than expected this year. Yeah. So. No kidding. Good season. Go Gino, yeah, go, go Gino, man. He's, he's pulling it <laughs> off. So, um, and actually it's funny, Russell Wilson, uh, the quarterback went to Denver and he, you know, oh, so I know. There's, a, there's a connection there as well between the Denver yeah. and the, so even with your business, No, I always give, um, I always give the Denver guys uh, a little crap for that. So <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I told I said, the when they traded him, I was like, is he going to be like the best trade ever or like the worst trade? It's like <laughs> the best trade ever so <laughs> the far. Best trade ever. We'll see. We'll see. How, at least if you're in Seattle, if you're in Denver, it's the worst trade. But yeah. I'm sure you have an inner conflict because there's people both sides there. Um, well, just for the last segment here, I wanted to um, ask you a little more. I mean, people are concerned today about rising interest rates. The Fed, at least at the time of this interview, just raised Feds another three quarter point. So we're we're continuing to go up. Um, that's affecting everybody's business. It's affecting. I've I've seen it in just investor sentiment, you know, how people are looking at investing and stuff or the wealth effect of the stock markets come down a little bit. So I'm feeling less wealthy. And so I'm therefore I'm less willing to take uh, action investing. But what are you seeing right now in self-storage and lending and the markets and valuations? Like what, what's happening right now? Yeah. Basis uh, cap rate um, on the last green screen or green street report said cap rates have expanded 20 basis points. So really not all that much. Um, that's up to an average cap rate for you know quality assets in the storage sector, 4.7% cap rate. So four and a half cap up to 4.7 cap, which is still ridiculously uh, low. Um, we've seen uh, so far rents have continued to increase. NOI is continuing to increase. Um, same store revenue growth, you know, in a trailing 12 for most of the REITs is double digits still. Um, so it's it's still a very impressive fundamentally um you know, good, good business. I mean, and, and everybody, you know, it, we haven't seen a big pricing reduction yet because self-storage does do, does well in recessions and groups know that. So that's kind of a flight to safety. It's kind of like the flight to bonds, you know, right. self-storage, self-storage is good during, um, you know, good times and it does great during bad times. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, cause we're going to have more life events. We're going to have more job loss, we're going to have people moving, downsizing, relocating to different areas. And that's what drives self-storage events. Um, so we, we've seen, uh, you know, good fundamentals continue. However, it's, we're not unique in getting loans. So the amount of lending that's available in the self-storage space is drying up. And, and I think if you can, um, you know, get seller financing or pay, pay all cash, that's or, or, or an assumable note, which is not as, you know, you multifamily guys, you guys have it awesome. I like pretty much everything's assumable in multifamily, yeah, right. um, unless you have some kind of a CMBS loan uh, for self-storage, there's really not an assumable option, not that many out there because um, we can't get that Fannie Freddie Mac stuff that, that has assumability clause. A lot of these local banks, regional banks and lenders that we go with um, don't have assumability uh, built in. Um, so we don't have a lot of that. So I would say unless you're planning to buy cash or you have some secret uh, lender <laughs> arm or, or get some kind of seller financing, I would say uh, it's going to be difficult to capitalize. So, um, you know, I, I see groups going with a uh, little lower pricing on all cash offers, but um, term sheets right now in today's environment are pretty much worthless. I mean, you can get a term sheet, but um, by the time you get to the, uh, the closing table, you know, a month or two after you get that term sheet, you're going to see it get retraded. I mean, that's what we're seeing. We're seeing, uh, you know, sometimes the lender is, you know, it's a good relationship and it sticks. And even our best relationship lenders have retraded us substantially on term sheets. I'll tell you one example. We had a lender to name, to remain nameless, but, you know, we had a fixed interest rate locked in in July. And we went to go close, you know, a couple of months later, they said, hey, the whole bank policy right now is going to go to a floating rate uh, based on prime. Oh. And so, you know, it, we had to wave off on the loan. You know, we, we're not taking any floating rate interest loans um, that, we, that we have to. We only have one in our entire portfolio. And, uh, you know, of course, caps now are super expensive because people don't, 
you know, think about it. It's like buying, it's like buying hurricane insurance, you know, and the, and the hurricane is going to hit your, your <laughs> landfall in three days. You know, it's like, oh yeah, uh, we can sell you an interest rate cap, but it's going to cost you 30% of the loan balance um, because it's, because we yeah. know that interest rates are going to go up. Um, but I would encourage, you know, the, the listeners, you know, there's actually a really good probabilities uh, chart and I'm, I'm happy to share you with the link there, but there's a great, you know, every time the Fed meets or is about to meet, there's a, a forward probabilities chart that you can go in and you can actually see the percentage probability of what the federal funds rate is going to be going forward. And if you look at it right now, um, the federal funds rate is supposed to increase another uh, basis point or to a basis point and a half uh, throughout the remaining of the year. And it's supposed to stay there until the end of next year. So it, this isn't going to get better. Um, I, I would say it's going to get slightly worse and be that way for at least a year. And then it's predicted to start to fall um, December, end of the year, 2023. That's where it's at today. It actually gets updated every single time the Fed meets. Um, so, but they just made it, they made a worst looking forecast based on the jobs number from last month, because jobs last month, you know, 261,000 jobs were added last month. And so the economy isn't, it's slowing down, but it's not slowing down on paper all that much. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 No, it's interesting. I, I just, I have conversations about this a lot because, um, you know, a lot of people are wondering like, what are, the confused mind will just say to wait and the challenge with inflation, yeah. if it's, you know, 8% or I think it's probably more like 15 plus percent when you count all the other things in there, they're not talking about. But uh, if you just sit and hold the money for the next couple of years, you could be losing 30, 40% of your purchasing power. That's why I think being in assets is powerful. And the second thing is when you buy an asset, you buy a self-storage property, you invest or a multifamily, you know, your buying price is fixed, but the interest rate can be adjusted later. So if you, you know, know you can at least handle it, whatever, what's going to happen, you know, rates will rise for a bit and then they start lowering rates. Well, there's all this money sloshing around. I think it's going to go into assets and people are going to say like, hey, let's, the outlook's going to be, it's going to be changed. So that's the whole Warren Buffett phrase of like, right, be fearful when others are greedy and be greedy when others are fearful. There's, so I think, I think it's a great time to get involved, but I think that's great. Well, Ryan, I feel like we could talk for a long time about macroeconomics, <laughs> about self-storage, about assets. I really appreciate you coming on the show today. Um, can you share with me with our audience, just one thing that's really helped you in real estate, whether it's, uh, obviously you shared that resource, um, the, uh, uh, maybe we can put that in the show notes, but is there something that maybe that's been a book or an app or a website or something that you use regularly that's just been really helpful for you and your real estate journey? Yeah, I would say us having a strategic plan, having a three-year strategic plan, and I'm, I'm happy to share uh, ours. It's, it's on our website. You can go download it uh, for free. And um, I, I would say just having a strategic plan and going through the, 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 the grueling uh, effort of writing down what your goals are for the next three years and, and how that translates into what you're going to do this year, quarterly, monthly, daily, weekly, I think is a massively beneficial thing for most people. Because um, I think if you don't know what you're planning to do, you're probably not going to end up doing it. Um, so I think having a street, three year strategic plan, writing it and sharing it with as many people as possible. Um, in your circle of influence, I think would will bring provide a lot of clarity. That's actually how we raised our first quarter million dollars was on it was on a strategic plan. We had absolutely mm -hmm. no experience in real estate, we had nothing to show, but we had a strategic plan, so it helped the investor see where we were headed and that we weren't just doing this, you know, uh, just to try it out and then you know sort of put it on the shelf and not do anything later. Right? So they actually could see through our vision. I think it's one one of your biggest um, resources, and I'd, I'd say the other resource that I would say is you know knowing thyself is really important. So when you do get into a relationship with other partners, um, make sure you get a personality test and make sure you get those personality tests shared with each other. So you understand who you're dealing with um, and, and how to best work with that person. A personality test that I like is 16personalities.com. It's free, takes you 10 minutes. And um, you, know, you can have your uh, fellow business partners do that. And then you can have just a better understanding of who you're working with. You know, is this person a defender personality that, you know, is going to defend themselves no matter what you say. So you kind of know that going in, or is this person very judgmental and they, they're very black and white. They want things written down. And I think just kind of understanding who you are and who your partners are uh, through a litany of those types of tests um, is helpful. We actually have every employee do those tests. And then we create these like little baseball cards. So I look at all my employees and I know exactly what makes them tick. I know what type of gifts they want, how they'd like to be appreciated, um, the type of personality that they have. 
Um, and it just helps you grow your organization faster because you know who you're working with. So. Yeah, that's huge. No, I think that's, I love personality tests, strengths finder, Myers-Briggs, kind of what you mentioned, the 16 personalities. Awesome. Well, how can people uh, follow you or what's the best way to uh, get in touch? Yeah, I'm on LinkedIn and um, also my uh, our website is spartan-investors.com or you can email me, ryan at spartan-investors.com. Awesome, Ryan. Well, thanks so much for coming. Just really appreciate all the value you're adding to so many people. And I love what's going on in self-storage and all the stuff that you're working on. So thanks for being here today. Appreciate it. All right. So this was a real treat. I love talking with people that are doing big things in real estate or in investing. And you have a guy who's a pilot who's now, you know, they've raised over 250 million. I mean, it's been 10 years. They are just doing phenomenal things. And, you know, as far as the operations, as far as you know, ground up development, lots of amazing stuff. So a few takeaways I had from this interview. One is to get clear on your goals, your mission, what it is you want to do. Because if you're clear on that, I mean, I go to goals events every year this year between Christmas and New Year's. I'm taking a couple days away to go get a whiteboard and just make goals for the you see the goals for the year, reflect on the past year and also create, you know, work on my mission statement, work on these things. I actually read my goals every single morning. I've got some videos on my YouTube channel that just talk about uh, how do you create great goals? I'll probably put something else together before the end of the year on that as well. Um, and then secondly, about partners, you know, the, this, the value of getting great partners that have similar values. And I love that he was able to find people that weren't in real estate really at all and be able to bring them in and be able to have, you know, see their skill set and really, I think great, great leaders do that. Great leaders call it out of people. And when, you know, it doesn't take people that are experienced to make this work. It takes people, what, that have good character, that really have a drive, that really want to do well and really want to improve their lives and improve the lives of others. So we've seen that. That's why I also look for, for partners as well. Um, I also want to take one more thought. If you would do me a favor, if you're getting value from this, would you please write a review uh, particularly on iTunes. We're trying to get as many reviews as we can. We've gone from seven reviews to 42 reviews now, and this helps us to get better guests like Ryan, but better guests, awesome people. So I want to read this one for you. This is from my phone here from, from iTunes, and it says, uh, this is from uh, e Edward Ian, and it says, Bronson's genuine nature and positivity allows him to attract industry heavyweights, heavyweights to his show. There is big power in his ability to ask great questions, gather different perspectives from the experts, and help us uh, sort out Sorted out to make strategic moves in our own investing lives. Keep up the good work, my friend. So thank you, Edward. I appreciate you uh, putting that on there. I will read more of these on future episodes. So I'm trying to get more interaction. Love to know, uh, you know how this is impacting you. And again, it allows us to get better guests. I also love to know who you want me to interview on this show. So uh, appreciate you taking the time to educate yourself because as you educate yourself, uh, it helps us all to get better. So look forward to seeing you on the next episode of Mailbox Money. You've been listening to the Mailbox Money podcast. For more free resources, articles, and videos, go to bronsonequity.com. There you can download your copy of the special report, The Single Best Investment Strategy During and After a Pandemic. None of the information shared here is an offer to buy a specific investment, and this is for educational purposes only. Consult your financial, legal, and tax professionals and use your own common sense before making any investment decisions. Thanks for joining us, and be sure to tune in next time for more Mailbox Money.